Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Usman Sadiq Paracha and today we would be having our lecture number 30 of the subject Applied Quantitative Analysis and Practices. Now previously we had a discussion on uh, different uh, methods for multiple regression how we can apply those methods in SPSS and how meaningful results can be obtained from the software in this regard. Uh, we had after going through uh, the application, we also then formulated the regression equation in a practical example and then we had the interpretation of the beta values of the independent and dependent variable which were included in that example. And uh, then we discussed about how to report that specific model. Uh, and then in the last and not the least, we discussed about the assumptions underlying multiple regression. So here basically uh, in all this uh, previous lecture, main focus uh, of uh, our theme was that uh, how basically this theoretical knowledge of multiple regression is applied practically in a practical situation uh, through the software named SPSS. Now here just to go in, having a recap of the previous work, we just uh, had a discussion on how to interpret the beta values. We know that the beta values are based on the change in the outcome associated with the unit change in the predictor. Likewise, uh, the standard, standardized beta values tell us the same, but again, they are expressed in standard deviation. Then uh, again, in the example which we discussed, and uh, in that uh, specific example, we were trying to find the impact of the advertising budget and uh, airplay on album sales. So let's say if we are to draw this model uh, in, I would say, on paper, then our model was uh, the advertising budget and uh, airplay, the number of hours that specific song was played on the radio and then likewise uh, its impact on the album sales. So basically we tried to test this model through re multiple regression and by plotting these values in SPSS. We were reported beta values for both as you can see that for uh, advertising budget this beta 1 value was reported and for airplay B2 was reported like this. So uh, basically from this we did come to know that how much unit change in, uh, in independent variable would cause uh, the desired change in independent variable. So anyhow, in this case, uh, we just had a discussion on that, uh, how to then represent this model mathematically. We uh, basically drew the same model which we have been discussing before. Again, as we discussed before, that we had to represent the two variables through their respective regression coefficients like beta 1 and beta 2. So here um, again uh, in this case once we have formulated the equation then we can calculate uh, uh, any amount which is given to us for advertisement and the plays and we can predict the sales as well but again as we have discussed before that we cannot extrapolate uh, 
in order to find out the values which are out of the minimum and maximum range of dependent variable. So uh, basically this uh, calculation of dependent variable is under certain conditions and uh, only under those conditions uh, this value can be so called predicted. So coming to the standardized version of beta values uh, we already have discussed that standardization is done so that we are able to compare the two beta values. Uh, the reason being so that uh, the beta values initially reported and which are unstandardized have been calculated in their respective units. So if uh, the unit measuring unit of uh, beta 1 is different from measuring unit of beta 2 then both the values cannot be compared. We can never be sure that which value is greater than the other. So in order to uh, calculate and uh, predict which value is in actual sense having more impact on the dependent variable, then uh, in order to do so, it's important that we standardize these values. And as you can see here, that we have got beta 1 as uh, 0 0.5 to 3 and uh, its interpretation is also written here as well and uh, we can clearly see that by that we mean that as advertising increases by one standard deviation then our sales go up by 0 0.5 to 3 of standard deviation. So likewise we have interpreted the second beta 2 value and from there now we can compare easily that uh, in this we can clearly predict that beta 2 basically is greater than beta 1. So coming to the interpretation as we have discussed before that uh, we just then try to predict by numbers and uh, basically we just uh, predicted that if we increase the budget by a certain amount, then what impact would it have on the real value of album sales? So uh, in this case, again, in airplay, we are facing the same phenomena. So this was the interpretation which you went through here. Uh, then we had a discussion on how to report the model because that's very important. Uh, just cutting and pasting the tables in SPSS in document is not going to fulfill the requirements of presentation of data. So in order to present the data and the results in the proper way in, uh, and also to report the model in a proper manner, uh, we just discussed how this is done and as you can see, that uh, in step one, we have got a certain uh, uh, variables here, then we have got a small beta and then standard error, and then we have got the standardized beta, and we have also got the uh, uh, p-significance value here. So based on that, we can clearly predict that here uh, in beta value, uh, we just present uh, their coefficients these coefficients are also termed as regression variates and uh, likewise we are also presenting the confidence interval here. So based on that again uh, the standard error is also presented here and the beta value standardized value is also presented. So also we can clearly see the level of significance based on that we have also reported the R square here. So you can see here that uh, R square is uh, uh, 0.34 or uh, you can say 34% of variation. Likewise delta R square is 33%. So uh, the model changed and there was a change in variance of 33% which was kind of significant. So uh, this is the way we discussed about how to report a standard model and it's how to report its result. Uh, then again we had a discussion on how to uh, go through the facts that how to assess the accuracy of model in the sample.
And here we are dealing with two kind of statistics. One is the standard residual statistics, and these are basically standardized for the same reason we have discussed before, because again we cannot compare uh, different residuals. So it is uh, also important that we standardize them so that we can have a benchmark to, in order to identify that which residual value is greater and which is smaller. Then we are dealing with influential cases, also termed as outliers, and these outliers are identified through a technique called Cook's distance, which is measured, and again, it should be less than one. But uh, then in case of standardized residual, we discussed before that now as we have standardized them, then our rulings for empirical uh, rule are very much applicable here. You may remember that in, uh, in the previous lectures that uh, uh, as per empirical rule, 95% of these standardized residuals should lie between plus minus two. Likewise, 99% of standardized residuals should lie between 2.5. Now here, uh, in order to identify the outliers in these residuals, it's the uh, limit here is 3. So if our residuals cross the value of 3, then that means that uh, our uh, respective value is an outlier. So uh, then we had discussed about another value called uh, Cook's distance. And in Cook's distance, basically, it's measuring the influence of a single case on the model as a whole. So. Um, again, in order to know the impact of a single case on a whole model, uh, here we had to discuss about the end values. And in this case, it is very much evident that uh, if the value is greater than 1 in Cook's distance, then we have got an abnormality in our data. And we have to look for that specific case and see what's the reason behind that. Then. Uh, then we had a discussion on uh, generalization and uh, again how we can generalize the sample to the entire population and in order to do that we have got certain assumptions. Now these assumptions uh, must be met. We have already discussed these assumptions in simple linear regression also and uh, they include like critical issues like linearity, normality, uh, homoscedasticity, equal of variance. So basically all these and also again uh, not uh, to forget the independence of errors. So basically these are the assumptions which must be met because if these assumptions are not met then definitely we cannot generalize our sample to the entire population. So our study won't be that much significant anymore. So in order to do that, this is very much important that uh, this generalization factor must be considered. Uh, coming to the another important issue which we have to deal specifically in multiple regression and that is related to the multicollinearity. And in multicollinearity, uh, this phenomena uh, is basically detected when we have got a lot of predictors and they are highly correlated to each other. Now, if these uh, independent variables are highly correlated to each other, then again, they would impact the result in a negative way. And the result which is then produced and uh, by assessing the impact of these independent variables on that dependent variable, then that impact would not be the representative, the true representative of those independent variables impact. So that's why this is very much important that our multicollinearity needs to be measured and justified. And uh, this again can be checked through collinearity diagnostics as we have discussed before. Uh, then we had just the discussion on the example that how basically these collinearity statistics are presented. And in this case, we already discussed that uh, one important 
uh, Meyer to uh, to basically see about this multicollinearity as the tolerance. And again, as a benchmark, it should be more than 0.2. Then we had got VIF, which is the terminology for variance inflation factor. And VIF should be less than 10. And in this case, it must be remembered that tolerance and VIF both are reciprocal of each other. Both are inverse of each other. So basically, now their standards, as you have uh, seen here, are justified in that. Then after uh, going through these collinearity statistics, uh, we have to have a discussion about the assumption checking uh, about the errors and as you can see that we have already discussed before that in order to check for homoscedasticity we have to plot these z values for residuals against the predicted values and their z values in this case. Also to in order to detect this normality of errors we have to uh, look the normal probability plotting in this case. So Coming to that, then we are dealing with uh, another issue and that is related to the plots which we have already discussed and uh, we plotted these through the partial plots option which is given in the resid residual plotting. Yes, you can see here that the patterns, different patterns are discussed and uh, if there is a kind of a pattern which is uh, kind of dispersed and it is not showing any st specific trend. So that does satisfy the condition for independence of errors and also for equivalence of variance. So uh, based on that we also had discussed about the partial plots for these uh, separate independent and dependent variables. And from there, we can very much assess what's the trend of the, and the, what's the nature of relationship between these different variables among each other. So from there, we can also decide about the homoscedasticity and independence of error factor there. Once we have gone through this thing, then again, we also went on to see that uh, how to check for the normality of errors and we come to know that histogram and PV plots are common way to check for normality of errors as you can see in the diagram. So here basically the actual values are then mounted on the predicted values. So based on that if this values do form kind of a straight line on the predicted value line that means that our PV plot shows that there is normality among errors. So then also regarding histogram we have got the same issue and you can see that uh, this is normality of errors here. Then there is another important debate about outliers and residuals in this multiple regression and uh, as you know that uh, unstandardized residuals are reported and uh, they are not of much use to us because uh, they are not standardized. We cannot compare these residuals with each other. So it's difficult to interpret these residuals in rel specifically in relation with each other. So in order to uh, tackle that, we use then standardized residuals. And uh, in this case, uh, this is obtained by uh, residuals divided by an estimate of their standard devi deviation. So basically these standardized residuals then can be compared. But then again for residuals standardized ones there are some general rules and in this case uh, we can say that uh, the standardized residuals with greater than 3 are of cause of concern. And this uh, value this high uh, cannot happen uh, by chance. So we have to look for that. Then we have got if, uh, if we have got more than 1% of our sample cases uh, having uh, standardized residuals with absolute value greater than 2.5, then this is a cause of our concern. And uh, then we can say that the level of error within our model is not acceptable. So based on that, then even the whole model can be rejected in this case. Uh, then we have got uh, another 
example, uh, point here that if 5% of cases have uh, values uh, greater than 1.96, then uh, that means that the model is a poor representation of the actual data. So these are three rules are the thumb rules which, uh, which are basically followed for uh, outlier identification in this case. So basically, uh, based on uh, these three uh, uh, rules, uh, basically the model assumption can be uh, stated as null and void. And uh, again, as there is another terminology which is used for uh, outliers and residuals, and it's termed as studentized residual. Now, this is basically. Uh, the same unstandardized uh, residual which is divided by its standard deviation, but that varies from point to point. Now they have got the same properties, but they basically give us a more precise estimate of the error variance, uh, specifically in a specific case. So uh, standardized residuals basically are preferred over standardized residuals because they give us a more accurate information in this case. Then we have got uh, the issue regarding influential cases identification. Now in order to uh, detect these influential cases, there are some statistics which can be used. One is termed as adjusted predictive value. And uh, basically it is termed as the value for a case that when that case is excluded from the analysis. Now, uh, basically, the computer calculates this whole model without a particular case and uh, then use this new model to predict the value of that outcome variable for which the case was in excluded. Now, if the case does not exert any large influence, then we can say that adjusted predicted value should be very much the same as the value to the value when the case is included in the setup. So based on that, uh, this difference between the adjusted predicted value and uh, original predicted value is termed as DF fit. Now here basically DF fit is reported in SPSS and we use it to identify influential cases. And uh, then again we have got another residual in which we've tried to find out the difference between the adjusted predicted value and our original observed value. And it's also termed as the deleted residual. So this deleted residual again can also be studentized and there's a certain formula for that as you can see. So based on it again uh, these kind of deleted residuals can be very helpful if you want to assess the influence of a single case on the whole model. So uh, basically, the another statistic which we have already discussed is related to Cook's distance. And uh, Cook's distance is used to identify the um, outliers in this case. So as we can see that if uh, for a specific value Cook's distance is greater than 1, then we have to re-examine that value and result again because that can have certain errors. So based on this thing, again, uh, these are the specific uh, outliers and residuals and which are used for identification. And uh, basically, these techniques are very much important to assess the real validity of data. Now, after we have gone through this debate of outliers and residuals in this case, let us examine another example which we can assess and see how SPSS can be used to track the impact of those independent variable uh, on dependent variable in this case. So uh, going through the same example which we have been uh, discussing before, we were dealing with the model termed as uh, the one in which we were taking training as an independent variable, then uh, we were using performance appraisal as another independent variable, then career planning. And uh, employee participation.
then we are dealing with uh, job definition uh, then we have also got uh, compensation now uh, basically these are uh, six to seven different independent variables uh, and we want to uh, measure the impact on organizational performance So here basically in this model uh, this thing is pretty much evident that uh, the main uh, matter is uh, basically the trying is the trying of uh, evaluation of these HR practices and their impact on dependent variable. Now here you can clearly see the impact which has been shown diagrammatically. Now if we want to check out the impact of these through force entry system or we can make a composite of these HR practices under the concept of high performance work system and then try to find out the impact of this composite on organizational performance. So let's try uh, this that uh, if we want to uh, measure the impact of all these independent variables uh, simultaneously on dependent variable then how we would be going to do that in SPSS. So then coming to our software. Now in this software uh, you can see the typical uh, fields in variable view. And here I have already calculated uh, some variables in this case. So as you can see in case number 194 that we have got uh, z-score for training a certain number of respondents and then performance appraisal, career planning, employee participation, job definition and then we all also try to calculate the composite term as high performance work system. Now here basically in this case uh, let's have a look at the question here. Uh, in questionnaire this is how this standardized questionnaire looks like. And here you can see that the uh, respondents are being asked about the training phenomena within a specific school. So uh, basically based on these questions, what we do is we try to calculate the means of these respective uh, questions and then we try to add them to make a composite which could determine the training variable by itself. Uh, then uh, coming to the next one, performance appraisal, we have got the same kind of questions related to the concept of performance appraisal and then we have got the job definition practice and career planning practice as well. So based on that we have also got employee participation and compensation factor. Now here basically these are the six variables which need to be assessed through multiple regression in this case. So in order to do that again organizational performance is measured through solid data which is objective in nature through school results. So in order to test the impact of these uh, four variables on that specific independent variable what we do is we run through SPSS, we run the SPSS here now here basically uh, in this uh, example we have already discussed about the uh, questionnaire and uh, also now in this SPSS file you can see the z-score of uh, various uh, uh, of various uh, constructs which are being considered here training, performance appraisal, career planning, employee participation, job definition 
and also we have got the result school result here now based on that the performance of the school is also measured now what we have to do is try to find out the impact of these independent variables on dependent variable called performance of school so what we do is we go to analyze we click on regression and we click on linear then we have got uh, to show the relevant uh, variables which must be tested and in this case here uh, our performance which is to be considered that needs to be found out from this long list of table and here you can see that uh, we have got uh, certain values which need to be discussed here uh, performance in year 2011 are the main focus of attention so we click on that and then we try to find out the impact of uh, the independent variables which we have already discussed in the diagram on the dependent one so we take the z values for all these uh, independent variables and we click on them like z t r g represents training standardized value then uh, we have got performance appraisal standardized value then career planning standardized value and likewise we have got employee participation employee uh, standardized value we have also got uh, z value for job definition so we click on that and we try to find out their impact through forced entry method so there won't be any block here so in this case first you have to click on statistics click on r square change descriptives partial and f uh, part correlation, collinearity diagnostics, level confidence. Then we have to click on Durban Watson here and again we have to give the course case wise diagnostic and in this case any value above two standard deviation is not to be included. We click on continue. In this case we have to now click on the plots option to determine the residual statistics here and for that we have to plot the z pre uh, predicted value at y and z residual at x uh, again we have to produce all the partial plots here so we click on that and we click on the histogram option and uh, also on the normal probability plotting here uh, we click on continue uh, then we have to click on save and uh, again the here you can see now all the residues which we have discussed before which can be used to track the outliers and influences now here in this menu in whichever um, uh, option we click on would be saved as a separate variable in the SPSS database where you can go and then have a look at each case residual value under these specific tests and see whether each test is uh, violating any extreme measure or whether it, the statistics or test statistics for these values are acceptable. So here in order to basically select uh, these different residuals we can click on standardize because unstandardized residuals are of not much importance to us we can click on standardize then we can click on Cook's distance we can also click on df beta and df fit likewise then we have uh, other than that uh, the predicted values which are standardized now here basically we just click on continue these would be the values which which would be basically calculated and saved as a separate variable in SPSS so coming to the next part which is options and here you can see
that you can use the probability of f, you have to identify what would be your level of significance here. Here it is for entry, it is clear cut mention that the level of significance uh, reported is 0 0.05. Also, we can um, uh, basically give some customized F values, but it depends upon the different situations under which these analyses are required to be run. Then we have to place the missing values issue and whether which option we would like if the SPSS finds any missing value at any place. So clicking on continue here, then we click on OK and let's have a look at the result. So now you can see here the results which have been generated uh, for the model which we discussed. It, uh, uh, descriptive statistics also show their relative values. One thing uh, which needs to be explained uh, specifically that why we did not take the original values of training, performance appraisal, career planning, employee participation and job definition and why did we take the z-scores for such variables. The reason being so is that, that once this is a kind of uh, mathematical transformation, we have converted them into z-scores or we have converted their original values into their respective z-scores because we, w uh, in this way, we can avoid multicollinearity. So this is one step, one uh, measure which can be taken in advance to avoid any kind of multicollinearity if there is any kind of correlation in between these predictors then by taking z scores of these relative values this kind of multicollinearity can be avoided so uh, specifically in multiple regression you should keep in mind that uh, if you are involving multiple variables then it is very much necessary that uh, you basically take into consideration their z-scores. Instead of taking their original scores for the analysis, this is pretty much advisable that we first convert all these values into z in their z-scores and then we inculcate these z-scores into their respective analysis. So here that's the reason that I have taken z-score for all these variables here and not their original values. So here as you can see the Pearson correlation has been reported and again we are also seeing their significance level. Here it is pretty much evident that uh, the z-score training uh, relationship with performance of school is 0.684 likewise performance appraisal uh, relationship with uh, the uh, performance of school is 0.817. Uh, all of these have got around about good correlation with performance of school. At, uh, however, uh, this is yet to be seen that some variables also have high correlation with each other. So again now coming to this uh, model summary in order to have a look about uh, how much this model accounts for the explanation for an independent variable. You can clearly see here that the R square here is 0.747 and when it is adjusted it clearly depicts that the value has been reduced to 0.732. Now, here the uh, F change is significant, its value is all right and the Durbin-Watson test clearly shows that the value is around about near 2. So we can rule out autocorrelation in this case. Then coming to the ANOVA table here we can see that uh, the regression here, the mean square of regression is quite higher than the residual. So this is kind of very much encouraging because then that, that 
clearly explains the high R square value as we have got the well most many values which are as per our predicted model type. So also we have got the F value which is significant so again this makes our uh, motivation stronger here for testing this model further. Then here let's uh, have a look at this whole model uh, from separate regression variates perspective for each uh, predictor and you can see the unstandardized coefficients which have been reported here. The z-score for training is minus 26.5 and then we have got performance in career planning and all that and then we have got job definition and uh, here basically we have also got standardized coefficients. Now this is kind of surprising because in this case this is uh, like for example in training this uh, standardized coefficient shows that uh, the value basically is minus 0 0.760 but it is not significant. Also this value is negative. Coming to the second value which is performance appraisal, it's standardized coefficient and it's also non-significant. Then we have got carrier planning z-score, it has got the value 0.541 but this value is significant and we are then dealing with the z-score for employee participation which is again negative and uh, non-significant as well. Then we have got job definition value standardized coefficient 1.042 and its t value is also non-significant. Now let's have a look at uh, the uh, collinearity statistics because those will give us a good measure. Now here you can see that the tolerance is very very low. You can see that the tr in case of training the tolerance is 0 0.012 way below the level. And then we have got various inflation factor which is sky high also not a good sign. Then uh, we have got uh, performance appraisal uh, value which is kind of still, still uh, kind of acceptable but not that much. So uh, basically from having a look at the tolerance values and various inflation factor of these uh, independent variables, this is pretty much evident that uh, these uh, variables have got uh, uh, high multicollinearity and uh, they are strongly correlated to each other. So that's why based on that our regression analysis may not be true representative of the actual findings. So coming next here coming to the collinearity diagnostic. Let's have a look if we have got more than two high loadings on a single Egan value. So here for dimension 1 we don't have any for dimension 2 again no strong loading for dimension 3 we don't have any but for dimension 4 we have got two uh, loadings which are at the same instance highly loaded on dimension 4 which again shows that there is high multicollinearity there. Coming to dimension 5 again there is no high loading but in case of dimension 6 again we have got two variables who have got high loading simultaneously on dimension 6 which again uh, proves our uh, assumption that there is multicollinearity among these independent variables. So coming to case wise diagnostics we are also seeing certain case values which are showing extraordinarily uh, not that much uh, uh, extraordinary high uh, standardized residuals. They are just above 2. So from there we can say that uh, though these values are above 2 but again as they are coming within the limit of 3 then these residuals can be accepted 
as normal, not uh, termed as abnormal in this case. Then we have got uh, also these uh, residual values for standardized residual, student residual, deleted residual. We have got their minimum values, maximum value. We also reported their mean. Uh, then we are dealing with the charts. And this is pretty much evident here that the chart here does show that the standardized residual are to some extent showing normality. Also, this normal PP plotting shows that uh, there is normality in the data. Coming to the scatter plot, uh, this does not show any specific pattern, so can be accepted. Uh, but still it's not to that much satisfaction. Then we have got the pattern regression plot in which we have plotted one independent variable with dependent and uh, from here it is pretty much evident that there is a little relationship between them or in other words it's kind of an inverse relationship. Here this shows us a kind of a positive relationship between performance appraisal and performance of school. Then coming to the career planning, we are uh, basically coming towards the positivity of relationship between these two variables. And uh, then we have got uh, same issue with employee participation and job definition as well. So basically all these graphs do show that this model does satisfy the regression assumptions to some extent. However, our main issue is the regarding multicollinearity. If you are dealing with strong multicollinearity among independent variables, then we sometimes have to rely wholly solely on uh, correlation coefficients in order to report the nature of relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable. So in this case, let's have a look at the correlation between the ind these independent variables and dependent and uh, it is pretty much evident that training has got a 0.684 correlation with performance. Performance appraisal has got 0 0.817 and uh, the rest of the values like uh, in career planning we have got the uh, correlation at 0 0.842 in employee participation and uh, performance appraisal this correlation of 0.694. Likewise the correlation between job definition and performance of school is 0 0.698. Now uh, these are kind of high values which uh, portray that there is a kind of a strong relationship between these independent variables and the dependent one. However, if we have a look at the correlation between these independent variables among themselves, then uh, let's have a look. There is a strong relationship between training and performance appraisal which is 0.672. Now that level of high correlation can obviously distort our uh, findings and which it did. So then we have got uh, uh, also uh, the relationship between uh, career planning and training is also termed here as strong which is 0.695. Now this correlation between these two independent variables is again uh, quite high and uh, this again explains the fact that why our findings in regression and analysis are distorted. Then we have got employee participation uh, relationship with training which is extremely high and it's 0.993. Now this kind of correlation can uh, obviously disturb our regression result and it has. Then we have got again a very high correlation of job definition with training. So basically keeping in view these uh, 
strong uh, intercorrelation between these uh, HR practices, these values definitely disturb our uh, relationship here. And uh, based on that, uh, this is advisable that we report the correlation basically in between the independent variables uh, and instead of going for regression uh, it is advisable to interpret their correlation with each other because such kind of high multicollinearity will have affected our results from regression and in this case regression or multiple regression is not suitable for analysis. So this is one issue which should be considered very, very carefully because uh, uh, that's why we run collinearity diagnostics after every regression uh, uh, analysis because that gives us a true uh, situation and, uh, and gives us a uh, true picture whether the values which are being reported through regression analysis are uh, really flawless or not. So here basically in this correlation part then is only used. Coming to the residual statistics, let's have a look at our uh, uh, main analysis data view and coming to the end of the field if you remember we asked for SPSS to save the regression coefficients for us in this case so let's have a look at the end field and see whether all these uh, error terms have whether they have been saved or not and here you can see that all those uh, regression uh, basically uh, variates and their uh, statistics have been basically uh, uh, saved here at the end fields here as you can see this is pretty much evident here now these basically are values which are standardized and as they are standardized so it's very easy to see which value is big and which is smaller so this gives us a very clear picture. In order to get the explanation of these uh, test statistics for residuals, we can click on variable view and then we can see at the end that here basically this is, uh, these are the various values which have been reported. Here ZPR is the standardized predicted value, ZRE is the standardized residual. SRE is standardized residual. Then we have got the Cook's distance as well, and then we have got DF. So basically, we have been given all type of uh, values related to residuals and which we can compare. Now, instead of looking at the data view, we can also ask the SPSS to summarize all these values for us. So we click on analyze and then we go to the uh, reports and we click on case summaries and then we click on the relevant cases which for which we want the summary so we click on standardized predicted value and we click on shift and click on the last one to select all these residual statistics we click on arrow button here to select all these variables and then we click on statistics here and that means the uh, cell statistics clearly show the number of cases and uh, then we can click on continue we can click on options which are it is representing the title which is case summary you can also give the caption here and we can click on continue now here first is the display of cases you must click on that because only then we can recognize that if we have got an abnormal residual statistic then which case is basically uh, presenting this uh, standardized residual. 
so then we can have a look at that case separately then limit cases to first standard it's up to you that you want to get the result displayed for only 100 or you want to get the result displayed for all so if you want to uh, limit cases it's all right you can keep the check on but if you don't then you can uncheck it then also we click on show any valid cases and also we want the case numbers to be there so that we can identify the relevant cases so then we click on OK and let's have a look at the output window and here basically you can see the real case summaries are displayed for each uh, residual now based on these standardized values we can clearly predict which value is the outlier because now in standardized case we have easily determined the benchmark and we also know that the th value of 3 is the extreme outlier case so we can have the look at these values and all these different residual statistics they do measure different criteria to determine different kind of outliers in this whole set so uh, we can easily detect them through these case summaries which we have just here and uh, also as we are given the case number in this second column we can also identify which case numbers residual statistic is troublesome in our case so here basically based on that this was our multiple regression analysis so in this lecture basically we had a discussion on what are the outliers and residuals in multiple regression and uh, what is the nature of outliers and residuals in multiple regression in this case how to detect them how we use SPSS for that and uh, in multiple regression uh, this is kind of important that there are different measures available to track outliers and residuals because uh, in this case we are interested in different situations uh, and in different scenarios in which outliers and residual statistics can arise how a single case can impact the whole model so how in order to do that how can we use uh, how can we detect that so adjusted predicted value or uh, things like uh, these basically gives us a f very clear overview of what impact as an individual case has on the whole model then uh, we have got other measures like coke distance and then uh, uh, we have also got deleted residual case or standardized residuals so all these measures basically are first standardized and then basically we have a look at them to see whether these different cases values satisfy these test statistics so uh, it is important that in multiple regression these outliers and residuals are detected from different perspectives so that we can have a clear picture of which case is causing an anomaly in the whole model uh, in this then we took a model uh, a practical model in which we basically had a look at the questionnaire through which we collected the relevant values for that model and then uh, how basically these values are incorporated in SPSS and then how we can run the multiple regression uh, on this model in this case so we took multiple predictors like uh, training performance appraisal employee participation job definition career planning and uh, compensation and we tried to determine their impact on organizational performance by employing multiple regression methodology so in SPSS we just put it there and we use the method of forced entry system and we tried to find out the, what's the impact on that now the interesting sign was that though the correlation did show that all these predictors have high correlation with dependent variable but again the regression analysis did show high multicollinearity through collinearity diagnostic which 
did portray that regression analysis basically is not giving us the true picture. And also that means that we cannot rely wholly solely on regression analysis statistic. So based on that we then had to rely on correlation analysis and then we discussed how to generate the residual statistics and how they can be reported and how these variables can be represented in the form of case summaries so that we can clearly identify that which case residual statistics are basically creating problem in the model. So basically this was an illustration of how to deploy multiple regression through the software of SPSS so that we can have a detailed look at the model. Though in this model we did identify that due to high multicollinearity regression analysis may not represent the true picture. So in this case when you are very much certain that uh, the tolerance figures and the VIF figures clearly depict that there is uh, a, a very high multicollinearity and the regression analysis is showing very abnormal results which cannot be proved by logic in normal life, then we have to have a look at the correlations so that we can know that what's the true relationship between them and then based on that we can ha test our hypothesis because through regression it won't be possible for us to commence further in this analysis technique. So I hope you understand this lecture. Thank you so much. Allah Hafiz.